Hello, I hope you find yourself well. Um, so we're going to continue with the variational principle module. Last lecture, what we did was present the theorem of variational principle itself. And then uh, we introduced uh, the variational method, also called the rayleigh reitz method, which is based on the variational principle. So what I'm going to do today is to keep presenting some um, application examples in order to show you how to solve these problems. Uh, the main idea is to reduce, at least for the problems presented, um, the, uh, the problem to a minimization problem as you would do in calculus. So let's start and let me share the screen now. Okay, so again, in this section, I'm gonna keep presenting examples of application problems in order to show you how to find the upper bound to the exact round state um, by basically reducing it to a calculus minimization problem. Uh, for the uh, examples presented. And I'm also going to finalize uh, the section by presenting some concluding remarks and essentially revisiting the theory that I introduced on the first lecture. So in a way, I'm going to reiterate on that information, but now that we have presented the theorem, the method, and some examples so that we recapitulate and we understand what we're doing uh, in a finer way. So, okay, uh, regarding the first problems, right? So um, I'm gonna present Bradley Ritz for actually two problems in Griffiths. One of them includes two different uh, cases. So the first one is uh, that we're gonna use Gaussian trial functions uh, of this form. And uh, in order to obtain the lowest upper bound uh, on the ground state of different potentials. So basically, we know that um, this is the form of a ground state of a harmonic oscillator. The potentials we're going to present in part A and B are not harmonic, but this will be our first guess on how the ground state will behave, essentially, because from Sturm Liouville theory, when the potential is well behaved, etc. Or it satisfies the assumptions, you know that there is uh, ground energy, which is the lowest eigenvalue, and uh, there is a ground state, uh, ground state which uh, has uh, no nodes inside the domain. So that's our basis in a way of why we choose the Gaussian. So, I mean, it's gonna try to fit um, the ground state of the other uh, potentials. In this case, what we have is a uh, Linear potential, strictly speaking, is uh, some sort of absolute value um, potential. So, I mean, it has the, I mean, it's similar to the harmonic oscillator in the sense that it has a minimum, right? Um, it doesn't have a derivative at zero. Uh, yet, I mean, at least qualitatively, basically, there is a potential well and there is a minimum for the potential function. So we're gonna try to um, basically find an upper bound uh, for the ground state by using these Gaussians as the trial space uh, of functions. So again, uh, let's uh, do this problem. Solution consists in the following. So, I mean, clearly this normalization constant is not independent of B because you need to satisfy the normalization condition that the basically norm squared of this is equal to one, which is what we have here, um, what's complex norm, et cetera. And so we take the normalization constant and this is the integral of this uh, Gaussian function uh, on normalized, right? So what we're looking for is precisely the normalization constant, which is gonna be obtained um, by imposing this condition, essentially that the product with this one gives you one. Uh, so, although perhaps we haven't dealt with this particular um, specific function, uh, we will have similar calculations to the ones we found on last lecture where we proposed basically a Gaussian times x. So some integrals will appear again, some others not, but anyways. So the first um, way to calculate this is essentially to make a change of variables, to put it in a normalized way. 
which, okay, here I can basically define a variable x times square root of 2d. And therefore that means that I have to multiply and divide by that factor so that this is transformed to some sort of normalized integral. And then you still have the factor of one over square root of two. The thing is from last lecture, we know that the, this integral is equal to square root of pi. So this is the final result, square root of pi divided by two b. And uh, now that we have the normalization constant, which uh, basically, well, you have to take square root of this and invert um, because you have minus one half. Um, you use this normalization constant to uh, be over pi uh, to the one fourth power uh, times the exponential of minus dx squared. So now we have the normalized, uh, excuse me, trial function. And um, well, now that the function is normalized, we can calculate the expected value of the Hamiltonian uh, in the following way. So of course, this is the, hmm. excuse me, I was drinking some wine. This is the average value of the Hamiltonian with the uh, proposed functions uh, considered, which are basically Gaussians normalized. So the normalization constant norm squared comes out and you have the exponentials of this form. We already know what is this. Um, basically we calculated it around here um, with, with these two. And uh, yeah, so this amounts for square root of 2b over pi since it's the inverse of this. And uh, then you have to calculate the average of the Hamiltonian operator under these uh, Gaussians. Um, where the Hamiltonian, as you remember, of course, has a kinetic theory contribution and a potential part. The kinetic is a typical one. The potential is this absolute value. And uh, we simply introduce um, the Hamiltonian operator to define our energy function. So um, again, basically what we have to do is to finish the calculation in order to get an actual function for the energy in terms of B. And uh, well, there are many things we have to do to achieve that. But one thing we can do, given that we're working with Gaussians is essentially um, to uh, basically integrate by parts the first term. Uh, so first I'm gonna rewrite the term. Then of course, uh, I simply express it in terms of integrals. The Gaussians have the main minus infinity infinity. It's a one bit problem. And uh, uh, well, this is the term that I'm gonna integrate by parts. So basically this is my u, this is my dv. So the b is the derivative, first derivative of this function. And I simply integrate by parts where the boundary terms will disappear because they are multiplied by a Gaussian which decays at plus minus infinity. So I only have the other basically minus b du uh, but it turns out that uh, du dx is equal to b. So that's why I have the derivative of this function squared. And I have a plus sign because it was minus minus. So um, yeah, integration by parts is important. You'll realize later on. Uh, on this other part, I can take the constant out of the integral and uh, simply multiply so that I have the exponentials together. Um, at this point, if I continue with the calculation, I simply need to take the derivative inside, which is derivative of an exponential. So it's exponential times the derivative of the argument, which in this case, it's minus two dx. And this will be squared. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the other term, if you notice, you have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of absolute value phase. So in this case, it's simpler to basically consider that it is function has even symmetry. And so this is twice the value of the integral from zero to infinity of the function for positive x where absolute value of x is equal to x. So this is easier to handle because I take out the absolute value I'm using symmetry and this is simpler. And of course you might notice that the derivative of uh, this um, is proportional to x. So I'm gonna basically put this in um, the form of a derivative to integrate easily. Uh, if I uh, evaluate the square over here, I have 4b squared x squared, exponential of this. 
And um, well, I can do some simplifications, of course. At the same time, I have to keep in mind the goal, uh, which is to express this in some sort of integration by parts form so that I can obtain the result easily. So in this case, let's do this integral first. So um, yeah, this is proportional to the derivative of the argument. So I'm simply going to multiply and divide by um, factors that let me obtain or express this in terms of the derivative of the argument, right? So basically, if I multiply by minus 4b and uh, divide by minus 4b, remembering that I have a factor of 2 because I made the integral from 0 to infinity, so you have minus half over 2b resulting from that outside. And here I have simply the derivative of the argument of the exponential times exponential. So that's easily integrable. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's clear that I basically put this in the form of du and I'll integrate that right away. On the other hand, beyond the simplifications in this case, as um, I'm also recognizing what's the form of the derivative of this argument because it turns out that I have the same exponential here. Uh, so basically what I need is, um, um, well, a multiply by one in order to get a minus uh, here and take out one B in order to put it exactly in this form, uh, partly, and times an X function. So which is what we're gonna do here because we have X squared instead of X as opposed to here. Um, so basically, if I multiply by a minus and take out a B, which is what happened here, uh, I have the X times minus four BX exponential. And as we saw, this is basically the derivative of um, the exponential function in here. So this is clearly doable by integration by parts because this is in the form uh, dv. So, okay, the two seem manageable at this point. Um, this one is doable. Basically I indicated uh, that this is the derivative of uh, this Gaussian. So times this factor. Uh, so uh, for the first term, I do integration by parts. So where I have uh, b du where u is x, so I have dx. And then minus alpha over 2b, the integral of the exponential, since I put it in a nice fashion, evaluated from zero to infinity. This one goes from minus infinity to infinity because I haven't used the uh, symmetries yet. Um, so, uh, okay, the boundary turns vanish again because I'm dealing with Gaussians. And um, um, well, um, let's see, uh, let's continue basically. This term, now if I analyze it, it's uh, a Gaussian integral, which I have uh, done before. So I simply have to change by uh, variable appropriately in order to perform it. I just take out the zero and minus minus gives me a plus. Then I have this integral. So it's gonna vanish at infinity, but at zero is one. And then you'll have a minus which uh, balances with this minus. So you have plus alpha over two B times one. Um, the last integral to do is again, making the change of variables. Uh, I simply define my variable x times the square root of two B, which is the argument of the Gaussian, uh, well, when you square it. And for that, you need to multiply and divide by the factor of the square root of two B um, so that you convert it to the Gaussian integral, right? So this is the normalized Gaussian integral um, times or uh, one over square root of two B and then with the d factor that we took out in order to put things in a nice way. This one is already solved. Uh, we know the result of this uh, integral is the square root of pi. So I just put it as uh, the result with uh, the factor of one over two b inside the square root. And so um, at this point, I have obtained the energy as a function of the parameter, uh, which will optimize. So you have your, well, there is one last piece of calculation that you have to do. Actually, there is a nice polishing of terms which uh, vanish by multiplying these two. You get simply h bars uh, b uh, divided by 2m and then the alpha over 2b factor divided, uh, well, multiply by this square root. So which if you simplify uh, by canceling the two b's appropriately, gives you this term where the denominator is the square root of 2b uh, pi.
sorry, I get thirsty because I talk too much um, during the session. And so I need a regular cup of water. So, okay, at this point, we are basically in a calculus problem in one dimension because we want to find the parameter B such that this energy function is minimum, right? Um, so what we also notice is that this function goes to infinity if B goes to zero or if B goes to infinity because you have proportional to B and I mean inverse to a power of B. So clearly the minimum is not in the uh, quotations marks uh, boundaries and you have to find it by localizing a critical point. Well, it's a smooth function in the domain where it's well-defined. So you simply have to evaluate the derivative and um, solve the derivative of the energy with respect to B equal to zero. So uh, that's a critical point we'll try to find. Uh, this term is proportional, so the derivative is quite easy. In this other, you have basically a constant times so B to the minus one half, which gives you this derivative. And so if you pass to the other side and you do some uh, passing around of terms, well, first of all, uh, there is a common factor of one half in both sides, which you can take out. Um, second, you clearly pass the B to the other side and pass the constants to the other side so that you get some cancellation. So, I mean, then you get alpha times M and then uh, actually the combination of uh, h bar uh, squared uh, times the square root of uh, two pi in the denominator. And uh, if you elevate to the square in order to get b cubed, so you um, basically uh, square the square root, all the terms are in these sets of even powers. Um, and uh, then you simply take a cubic root in order to achieve your result. There is one single term which you can um, take out of the cubic root since you have four power of h bar. All the others just remain inside uh, to give a Polish expression. But the point is that you found the optimization argument that minimizes the energy function since basically it goes to infinity to, uh, when you uh, approach the boundaries. So it must have um, um, at least a minimum inside due to the fact that this is a smooth function. Um, so, um, okay, now that we found the optimization argument that minimizes the energy as a function of the parameter B, uh, we want to compute the minimum energy uh, for this optimization parameter because that will give you the upper bound for the ground state for the proposed uh, family of functions, which in this case were Gaussians. So we simply plug in, we had a formula for the energy, which is over here. And uh, well, plugging in one term is proportional. For the other, you have to do some manipulations for the square root. Um, so we plug in this value. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Well, yeah, we plug it in the square root uh, as well. Um, there will be some cancellation going on. Um, essentially, what you will do is to especially in the square root, um, to put some terms inside to make things simpler. Uh, for example, well, you have two pi outside the cubic root, so you might as well put it inside with a cube for compensating. And uh, that lets you divide. Um, it's not useful to pass the h bar uh, at this point because you have also a h bar, but in the denominator, so there won't be cancellation. But for the two pi, you basically eliminate the denominator and you have a square here. And um, well, we have cubic roots at this point, it's not completely helpful. What you have to do is to simply uh, properly express these square roots uh, to flip uh, numerator and denominator to put them in a nice way, uh, which is this, right? So, and notice that, um, well, you have cubic root, but then the factor of one over h bar and this other thing is inside the square root. So um, the h bar basically is uh, related to a power of one half, but the term inside is uh, related to a power of one over six. So 
we're gonna do that because now we can see that the only thing we are remaining to cancel is the alphas. And so we'll put the alpha inside. So the square root of um, h bar, which comes from this, will be untouched virtually. Then you put alpha to the sixth power to cancel and account for this. And then there will be some cancellation, right? So basically you'll have alpha to the sixth power divided by alpha squared. And um, there hasn't been too much change in this term. Actually, I don't think we have changed it at all. And um, well, now you have h bar alpha to the four, uh, these terms are squared. And what you can do is to take out the um, h bar and add the powers and uh, simplify the other terms because they are basically to even powers. So if you um, basically factorize this in order that this is a squared, then you have two over six, which is one over three. Um, then you have alpha squared to pi m, right? So at this point, the only thing to do is to add the powers. So basically if you have one half plus one sixth, you have four over six expressing this as three um, over six. And um, the last simplification is, let's see. Well, um, yeah, what you can do is to put this inside uh, because this would be two thirds and this is to the one third. So you have h bar squared and uh, inside the one uh, third uh, factor. And now you see that you actually got things in nice form because essentially the, these two terms have the same units. Uh, the only difference is that this has a factor of one and this has a factor of one half. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is also typical behavior of minimum problems. Um, so what you have is uh, that when you, when you add these two terms, you have uh, the same factor to the power one third times the uh, factor three over two. So this is basically the upper bound uh, for the ground state given the Gaussians uh, were used as uh, trial family functions for the absolute value potential. Um, the second example is to do a quartic potential, right? So again, this has the features of the harmonic oscillator in the sense that there is a local and global minimum at zero. Um, at least in this case, the function is smoother. So it's not uh, with a peak or a tenth as in the absolute value. But, um, well, strictly speaking, um, the ground state might not be a Gaussian, but it's not a bad idea to use it as a way to fit or approximate the ground state because at least qualitatively, the quartic potential has some similarities to the harmonic potential, which is proportional to x squared. So we'll see what we get. Uh, again, we're going to use Gaussians, and we have already solved the normalization problem in A. So we know the energy function. Uh, the thing is that the Hamiltonian has a different potential, right? So the kinetic theory, sorry, the kinetic energy, I think in my own research topic, I apologize. The, kin <laughs> the kinetic energy uh, remains the same. Uh, the potential uh, is now alpha times x to the fourth power. And uh, well, we're still dealing with Gaussian. So the integration by parts of the first term related to the kinetic uh, energy, which, uh, uh, well, we'll do again. Um, for the other, you basically take out the constant and you have the x fourth sandwich between the Gaussians. And yeah, I mean, integration by part uh, was justified before. Uh, basically, there is a minus minus, which uh, gives the plus um, when integrating by part. So that's why you basically pass one derivative to the other side and there is a minus minus, which gives you a plus. Uh, but the thing is that you now have the inner product of um, this function with itself. Um, so the other part is just uh, expressing these functions uh, in terms of integrals. Uh, 
So the domain is minus infinity infinity. You have an appropriate factor. And uh, then it's this term squared, which is the derivative of the exponential of minus bx squared and all that squared. And you have to compute also this integral. And again, uh, I make my point that because we have dealt with Russian problems in the previous example in this lecture and in the past lecture, actually some integrals uh, have appeared before. So, excuse me. Mm, well, in this case, um, it's virtually the same integral that we did in the previous problem uh, for the kinetic uh, energy contribution. For the other, um, uh, what we're gonna do is to perform integration by parts. Um, well, actually we have done that before, so we're not gonna do the computation again. We basically did last time with integration by parts and made our life easier. So we're gonna build up on the knowledge we, we have already constructed. So the first integral is basically the same one as last time. If you remember, we have a factor of v times uh, h bar squared divided by 2n. Then we have the square root of pi divided by uh, 2b. Uh, for the other, we're going to use the result of last lecture. Please consult it. We also had the square root of pi over 2b. It's just that the factor was 3 over uh, the square of 4b. Um, so we are going to use these results. We basically have to plug in, in the appropriate uh, parts on this expression. So this integral was um, uh, h bar squared b divided by 2n times this square root. For the other, we have these results. Um, and well, um, of course, not forgetting the factor of alpha that we have here and the fact that all this is multiplied by the normalization constant of the wave function squared. So there's gonna be some canceling for the square roots, which actually put things in a nicer fashion. So that's why you have only uh, h bar squared times b divided by 2n. And here you have three alpha divided by uh, 4b, all 4b squared. And again, we have basically a contribution that is uh, increasing with b and one that is uh, proportional to uh, basically an inverse power of p. So that is making the integral, or sorry, the energy function go to infinity when b goes either to zero or to infinity. So again, basically the function goes to infinity in its boundary. And therefore, since it's also a smooth function, the um, minimum must be a critical point. So we localize it by taking the derivative of this function and equating to zero, which is what we do. The proportional term has an easy derivative or the other basic, what you have is a constant times uh, b to the minus two, which is why you have minus two b to the minus three as a derivative multiplied by appropriate constants. Uh, we have the 16 appearing. Then again, you pass to the other side. Uh, you can do some simplification. Actually, you can pass the b cubed in this part. And if you do some polishing, where essentially um, you can clean up this uh, factor of two, which will give you a four in here. And pass to the other side um, and also the h bar squared. So the optimization parameter solution, B naught, is uh, the cubic root of this term. So, which we just present like this, because all powers inside are less than three. So this is the optimization argument that minimizes the energy function. And now we want to calculate the upper bound, right? So which is basically the minimum energy over the final functions considered, which were Gaussians. So this was our energy function. Uh, we're gonna plug in simply this value. Uh, one part is proportional to B naught, so that's easy. The other, basically what you have to do is to put B naught um, and square and then take inverse. Um, so the simplification will be mostly dealing with this part. Actually, you can also simplify the first term because, well, you have h bar squared and, um, well, the h bar is in the denominator in the uh, cubic root. So what you can do is to 
keep one H bar inside, the other put it inside the, sorry, you keep one outside, then the other you put uh, inside the cubic root, but with a power of three to um, appropriately account for H. And there's some cancellation, of course. Uh, now you have basically H bar because it cancel H cube divided by H squared. Uh, you could also put the M inside because uh, there is an M in the numerator. So we can do the same. Uh, so putting it inside, you have M cubed. So which cancels and you have M squared over here. And um, well, yeah, uh, in regards to this term, I think this is as much cancellation as we can make. Uh, for the other, you can simply polish. Uh, what you can do is, um, actually you can put the factor of four inside the cubic root, uh, which will cancel with at least one factor of four in the denominator. So you have four cubed divided by four, which is four squared. And all this is to the basically power two thirds because you had cubic root and then squared. So the last part for this term is to basically put terms uh, appropriately by flipping uh, things numerator to denominator since it's in the denominator of the full expression. And yeah, this part uh, basically is polished at this point. Then you have three alpha, then you have this, but you notice now when you have flipped and put things in a nice fashion is that you can have some cancellation with alpha and also with three uh, because they appear so you simply put this factor of three alpha inside with uh, a power of three halves so that you account for the appropriate uh, dependence of this term. And there will be some cancellation, of course. Um, so you simply have to uh, uh, get uh, three to the three halves minus one, alpha to the three halves minus one, etc. cetera. Uh, for this other, yeah, it remains the same. So that's why you have uh, three to the one half, alpha to the one half. And let's see, can I do something else? Mm. No, I don't think so. Uh, I think what happens uh, then later on, um, or what uh, could be done is that uh, the terms that are squared inside, because outside you have two thirds, basically you'll have H bar to the four thirds or four to the four thirds and so because the power is greater than one, you can put uh, some part outside, which is what we'll do. The others basically will remain inside and we'll do some uh, polishing in order to um, express things appropriately. This term is untouched. So we can uh, elevate to the two thirds, the terms inside, uh, which is completely to separate. So basically, since they are related to one half, you have three alpha to the one third this term inside is uh, basically one over m squared to the one third. Then you have uh, this term, which is one third plus one in terms of its powers. So you can combine these two, for example, and actually uh, all these three, uh, which is giving us something that we expected in a way, you'll see in a second. Um, so what you have is the first term is proportional to h bar over two uh, times this cubic root. Then for the other, if you combine the factors, you have three alpha h bar divided by four m squared to the one third, which is nice because you had exactly the same term on this side. So again, this is a feature of minimization problems at least proportional. <clears throat> and the last part to consider is this factor of h bar over four, which is one half this other factor of h bar over two. So what you can do is to factorize by the cubic root term to uh, add these together. And so you have three h bar over four. So uh, this is the upper bound of the ground state energy of the quartic potential. So in a way, uh, if you think about it, well, of course, you can define kind of like the frequency that it's overestimating uh, in a way, but never mind. I mean, the ground state was a good choice for an approximate potential in this case. So this is the upper bound. Uh, most importantly, I just want to show the methodology, which is at least for the problems with one parameter, find the normalization constant, calculate the energy uh, 
as the average Hamiltonian, then obtain this function just in terms of the parameter of optimization, B in this case, and minimize as in calculus. That's for this one, the problems, that's all that you have to do. Um, so the last part, and we're getting close to the last part, but not yet. Um, we're gonna present another problem, which is actually also for degree fields and it's according to the scale uh, of an increased degree of difficulty. So what you have to do is to find the best uh, bound on the ground state energy for the 1D harmonic oscillator, uh, where you use a trial wave functions, basically this uh, function. So the potential in question will be harmonic, but the trial function will be uh, basically proportional to one over x squared plus b squared. So qualitatively, it does have a similar behavior to the Gaussian in the sense that uh, it decays when you go to infinity. Then you have to normalize it, of course. It is bell-shaped also. Uh, it has a single maximum, it is even, etc. So it's not a bad guess in a way. Um, we know the true ground state, which is a Gaussian, right? So this function is not exactly a Gaussian and because it's not exactly a Gaussian, its energy is gonna be greater than the ground state one. So yet, uh, we still want to look for uh, the function of this bell-shaped form, which gives me the minimum energy over functions of this type normalized. And then I'll compare the result of, the, um, of this energy to the true ground uh, energy of the harmonic oscillator. So again, B is a parameter, A is a normalization constant that depends on B. So first things first, we have to find the normalization constant. Um, of course, uh, we only consider B greater than zero because if you have B equal to zero, this will be one over X squared and there are some singularities uh, at zero. So B is gonna be positive. And we uh, will want to satisfy the normalization condition where, okay, the normalization constant norm squared comes out and we have to calculate this integral of the function squared. So, well, if we do that, um, we first have to calculate um, this integral in order to know what's the value of A. Um, okay, so we have the integral of uh, one over X squared plus B squared and all that squared. So the intuition is that when we have X squared plus B squared, a trigonometric uh, substitution might be ideal. And so that's basically the main difficulty of this problem. Uh, the reason Griffiths uh, gives it to two stars instead of one star is because the integrals are not your typical Gaussians and you have to identify which substitution you have to do. However, um, once you identify that the substitution that is helpful is a trigonometric substitution, you're done because most of them will be doable this way, even if they are of different forms. So one uh, advice in order to handle these ones is to normalize things first, because you would like, for example, to have something like uh, X squared plus one, because in that case, you, uh, you can identify basically cosine squared, sine squared, et cetera, et cetera, or uh, some other trig identities related to the tangent and the second. So we better basically um, factorize the b to the fourth power out of this, which means that you have the square of x over b squared over here. And uh, well, um, you can also accounting for the dx factor, multiply and divide by a b. So that's gonna give you the one over b cubed outside. And things will be cleaner because under the change of variables x over b, you can define a new variable y, which also goes from minus infinity to infinity since b is positive. And dy is basically um, accounting for this. So this is way cleaner. And again, I'm trying to make the point that we can use trigonometric substitutions to calculate it because, well, if you think about it, y is uh, proposed as a tangent of theta. And the same way you have the cosine squared plus sine squared equal to one, 
you have the related uh, or derived uh, trig identity for the tangent by dividing by cosine squared, where you have one plus tangent squared equal to second squared. So what we're gonna do is to identify precisely, right? Since y is the tangent, one plus y squared is the second squared, and then dy is second squared d theta. So there's gonna be some cancellation and things will be hopefully simpler. So when I do that, I also have to change the integration variable. So the tangent that goes to minus infinity infinity when the domain is minus pi helps pi helps. So I will select that as the domain of integration for the angle theta. Then you have dy, which is second squared theta d theta. Then you have uh, basically second squared squared, which is why you have second to the fourth power. And then you'll have some cancellation, right? So which is why you have one over second squared, which is the cosine squared and from minus pi halves to pi halves. So at this point, this is your typical cosine squared integration that appears in quantum mechanics. This is very common. And you simply go to trig identities used in calculus to calculate nicer this thing. Um, so you know that basically cosine of the theta is cosine squared minus sine squared, which can be expressed as two cosine squared minus one. And then if you flip things, uh, basically you have that cosine squared is one plus cosine of two theta over two, which is the substitution that you will do. So the integral of interest is basically one half for this factor, then basically one plus cosine of two theta, uh, and then from minus pi halves to pi halves. So one term is, uh, one term is easy, um, which is pi. So this term, which is basically integral of the theta evaluated uh, between the limits. So this is pi, so two pi over two. And the other part, it's uh, basically gonna vanish. So, well, you can do this, of course, you multiply and divide by a factor of one half uh, in order to put this in terms of the sine of theta when integrating. So you have two cosine of two theta times one half. So integral of that is sine of two theta, then with a factor of one half, and then evaluated from pi over two and minus pi over two. But the point is that you have two theta, so you will have sine of pi or sine of minus pi, and both of them are uh, zero. So basically you have the single term pi with a factor of one half outside, which is pi over two. So now that you have calculated it, you resort to the original integral and uh, this is pi over two times the factor of one over d cubed that you had before. So this is just for the normalization. The integrals are gonna take a little bit longer because there are trick substitutions of seconds, etc. but they're doable once you get the gist of it and essentially you will have to do the same uh, substitution over and over for different integrals. Um, so you have one equal to norm a squared of this factor pi over two d cubed. So a squared is the inverse of that. And then uh, basically for a you up to a phase, you can take uh, the square root of that. So two d cubed divided by pi to one half, uh, b is the only one, uh, with a power greater than one half. So you leave one B inside and you have B squared to the one half, which is B. Um, so now we have the normalization constant since uh, we have different functions. Bear in mind that at this point for the different problems that we have done. In the first problem, we had truncated parabolas. In the second, we had a Gaussian times X. In the third one, we had a Gaussian. And in this case, we have these bell shaped functions. Uh, which look a little bit like a Lorentzian distribution, if you remember your homework. But, um, well, never mind. Uh, this was for the normalization constant. And now that I have the function normalized, I can compute the energy as a function of the optimization parameter B. So again, uh, I have the normalization constant squared outside. Um, then, um, I'll, I use this Hamiltonian, which is the harmonic uh, oscillator Hamiltonian with the potential proportional to x squared. And well, now we have to handle this term, right? If we want to do an integration by parts of the first term, we have to justify it in terms of vanishing of bound return. So the first thing we do is plug in the Hamiltonian. We separate in two parts. So we take a proportionality constants out, then we have second derivative, and then basically this x squared because it's the harmonic potential with the appropriate constants. 
And well, um, I'm gonna justify why I can pass the term to the other side. And basically this is because the boundary integrals will be zero. So what I'm gonna do is to perform integration by parts on this term, which would pass one derivative to the other. And then I have inner product of the derivative of this function with itself. But the reason the integration by parts uh, gives you boundary terms that are zero is the following. So this would be your u, this would be your uh, b, and then evaluated from minus infinity to infinity. Basically, even if you compute the derivative, I mean, so you'll have minus two x divided by this squared, but the power of this, which is order one, cannot compete with the power of the denominators. So all things decay when you go to infinity or minus infinity, especially because this is a two squared and this one return is zero. So it's just easier to compute uh, the integral this way. Um, actually there are techniques um, computational which make a lot of use for this, but uh, well, this is beyond the, the class. So, well, we have to continue uh, calculating. Here we have the x squared term times uh, this function squared. Uh, here we just have to compute the derivative of the term inside m squared. So the derivative of the term inside is, um, well, because this is the inverse of x squared plus v squared, would be minus this object to the minus two times the derivative, which is two x, and then all this is squared. Um, of course, we have a plus because we uh, integrated by parts, so minus minus is a plus. And uh, well, uh, it's true that in principle, we could factorize all of this and express it in terms of squares, but to actually compute things, um, we have to put it as x squared and then uh, this factor squared. Um, then what we do is to elevate, right? So the minus uh, disappears with the squaring. Then you have four x squared and then you have this term to the minus four power. Um, so uh, let's see, what you have to do is to, um, Sorry, I got distracted by emails. For this term, uh, I think it's kind of clear that you'll have a trigonometric substitution going on the same way with, with the tangent and the second, etc. Uh, for this other, actually also, uh, although the power might uh, seem higher, but there will be some cancellation out and I will show it in a second. Um, we, I don't think we will do this by part, so we can take out the four uh, from the integral. And so this accounts for a factor of two with the twin denominator. And uh, yeah, I mean, at this point we just have to do them. So again, both of them need a trick substitution. This one is easier because the denominator is uh, squared. Um, so let me present it. And again, the technique is, it's much simpler to recognize the trick substitutions once you take the B factor out just makes life easier, you know? You're basically normalizing the integral in a way and then just dealing with functions which are tricks. Um, so here you have a factor of four uh, for the B, uh, well, a factor of B fourth, which you can take out by normalizing properly. Uh, so, and also um, since it's clear that you'll have the variable X over B, it's quite convenient to basically appropriately use some of these terms in order to account for the change of variables. So you have four uh, powers of B uh, and here you have three. So use three of them and then take one outside, right? Which is what has happened. So B is here, then you have two powers of B, one remaining power of B and you're done. So this is why you have the one over B outside and then you do the change of variables where again, minus infinity to infinity because B is positive. So Y equal X over B also spans that domain. And then you have Y squared plus one squared uh, in the denominator dividing Y squared times dy. So yeah, this seems pretty manageable. And again, it's this trick, right? I mean, it's clear that um, you'll have the second squared and the tangents, etc. So if you propose Y, I'm writing exactly the same uh, substitution, but I'm just, I don't want to go back to the file and just for clarity. 
So if y is the tangent, the derivative is second squared uh, based on the cosine uh, plus sine squared, both um, uh, identity by dividing by the cosine squared, I get this one, which is well known. And given the substitution, one plus y squared is second squared. So I can substitute and then all this, what you have is one over b integral of y squared of this squared uh, uh, dy. So if you do the substitution again, uh, the tangent spans minus infinity infinity when the domain is minus pi over two pi over two. So by doing the change of variables um, in the appropriate domain, y squared accounts for tangent squared y squared plus one uh, equals uh, second squared, which is also squared. And then you have the dy, which is second squared of theta d theta, right? So there is some simplification going on. Um, uh, basically you'll have one cancellation. So you have tangent squared over second squared, uh, d theta. Um, and this is simple because, well, second squared is one over cosine. So you basically have cosine squared uh, times sine over cosine uh, squared, both. So that gives you sine squared. And at this point, this integral is as manageable as the other, right? So again, using the trig identity of cosine of two theta, cosine squared minus sine squared, which is one minus two sine squared uh, by just putting ter this in terms of sine squared, uh, you pass to the other side. And then you have that basically sine squared of theta is one minus cosine of two theta divided by two. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, at this point we have normalized the integral. That's why we have the factor of one over V. Uh, then, well, what we'll do is to plug in this form of the function. So we plug in, there's a factor of one half coming in from that. Uh, and then you only have to integrate one minus cosine of two theta over two. So again, there will be some vanishing. This one is very easy to integrate because this is the theta over the limits. So to pi over two, which accounts for pi. Uh, for this other, basically what you have is to multiply and divide by two. So the only difference with the previous case is that you have a minus and before you had a plus. Um, so, excuse me. Uh, here you have, um, pi over, uh, well, sorry, I got distracted by something. Um, basically, you have the integration with a factor of one half. Then you have to evaluate. Um, excuse me, uh, yes. And again, the same vanishing will happen. Basically, when evaluating, you'll have uh, two sine of pi, but sine of pi is zero, so it vanishes. And so again, you have pi over 2b. So it's the same result as in the previous case. So if you go back to the original integral, which was 1 over b, this normalized integral, and we have kept the factor of 1 over b, the original integral is pi over 2b again. And we're only missing to compute this other integral, which seems more complicated because you have uh, power 4. Um, so actually, if you think of dimensionalizing all these to make things more recognizable or manageable. Uh, you have a factor of b to the eighth. Uh, then you have to normalize. So that's why you have x to the b squared inside. Uh, all this to the fourth power. And you have uh, basically three needed factors of b in the numerator. So that's why you have b to the fifth and you use the remaining factors basically to normalize x squared and to normalize dx. So under that, you can take the b uh, to the fifth uh, in the denominator outside. And by the change of variables x over b, where b is positive, so y also goes from minus infinity to infinity, you have the integral of y squared dy, and then uh, divided by the fourth power of uh, y squared plus 1. So I mean, at this point, we have just normalized. Um, the difficulty in terms of the degree remains, but at least some simplification will be more manageable. And again, we propose the tangent of theta, which uh, whose derivative is second squared. Then you have one plus tangent squared equal to second squared. And recognizing y is tangent, then you have one plus y squared equal to second squared. So if you do that uh, manipulation, basically what you have is uh, y squared is tangent squared. Then you have second squared to the fourth power and dy accounts for second squared, right? So there will be some cancellation. 
uh, now basically basically you have second squared this is to the first power this is to the fourth power that's why you have just uh, to the third power in the denominator after you do some cancellation but most importantly um, you can simplify and separate some terms so because here you have tangent squared it might be better to just um, put second squared uh, to the first power um, separated and do some simplification as we did in the previous integral and here you have the one over second squared squared separated so what we remember from this <clears throat> excuse me from this simplification is that this gave you sine squared so which is basically sine over cosine times cosine um, squared for the other you basically express this as cosine squared squared because you have one over second and well why am i doing this because um if i use my trig identities for cosine squared and sine squared in terms of the cosine of twice the angle uh, i will have something more manageable and i might have linear terms and i can recognize derivatives etc so if i do that and i plug in these uh, identities so i have this uh, my original integral well actually normalized and then I have the cosine squared, which is one plus cosine of two theta squared. Then I have sine squared, which is one minus cosine of two theta over two. Uh, but I mean, in this case, you have sine squared of theta. So this one is linear. So you're good to go. And well, taking out all the factors, basically you have two squared times two, which is eight. And then you have one plus cosine squared and then one minus cosine of two theta. Um, and well, uh, again, remember that the domain went to minus pi over two pi over two by the tan substitution. Mm, let's see, what else can I do? Um, yeah, so what is easier in this case, just if you play a little bit with algebra, is that you recognize that uh, basically this is the square of kind of like the conjugate of this other term. So you could think of this as one minus co uh, one plus cosine of two theta times one plus cosine of two theta times one minus cosine of two theta. And so you have this term to the first power times a squared minus b squared. So this is why you have one plus cosine of two theta, and then you have the product of this to the first power times this, which is one squared minus cosine squared of two theta. So this is a little bit of high school algebra, but still it's quite useful. Um, and why? Because, well, uh, some of these terms will become simpler to integrate, especially once you get this, one minus cosine squared is equal to sine squared. The thing is that it's now for two theta. And uh, conveniently or luckily, basically, for this other linear term, this term is related to the derivative of the argument of this one. So basically what you have is sine two theta squared, but the derivative of sine of two theta is proportional to cosine of two theta. So what you can do is to uh, is separate um, so do the multiplication, things are way more manageable now. Um, then you have the integral of sine squared of two theta, and then you have plus cosine of two theta sine squared of two theta. So this is recognizable as a function, uh, uh, well, function of a given argument times the derivative of the argument. And so that can be integrated easily. For the other, it's actually simpler if you remember that sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to one. So I'll go to that in a second. But um, well, now that I have this, um, let's see, have I done some change over here? Sine squared of two theta, cosine squared. Well, no, here, what I have done so far is to, to separate them. So I just put them separately. So I continue with this integral, you have the factor of one over eight. Then um, what I'm gonna do is a substitution just to make things more evident in the sense of, uh, having a new variable, which is, uh, if you want theta prime, which is two theta, and the change of variables uh, will account for a factor of one half due to the d theta, but otherwise, basically the domain goes from pi to minus pi. And the point is that the domain pi to minus pi is length of two pi. And uh, you're considering sine squared of theta, which is a function which has period to pi. So basically, uh, what you're thinking is of integrating sine squared over its period. But what you also know is that sine squared plus cosine squared are equal to one. 
and basically the integral over the period of sine squared is the same as the integral over the period of cosine squared because I mean up to a period they kind of like look the same you just have to shift them and so this integral it's basically one half so uh, uh, well uh, times the appropriate uh, domain because this will be one half the integral from minus pi to pi of one so in addition to the uh, factor of one half over here um, so what you will have is basically um, sorry mm. um, some cancellation um, so let's see what else I have to do uh, yeah, okay, so before I get to the final result of this, I want to calculate this one. So in this other case, basically what I have is, um, well, if I multiply and divide by a two, I have the derivative of sine of two theta over here, which is two cosine of two theta. So this is quite recognizable. The only thing is that I have a factor of one half. Because these two have a factor of one half, I can factorize that. So. One of these came from the substitution from two theta to theta. The other came basically to account for the derivative. But if I take it out, basically I have one over 16 and I can focus on the value of this integral. And so what I was mentioning is that this integral is one half the value of the integral of one over a period. Uh, so that is basically one half of two pi. So which is over here. Uh, for the other, I just do the substitution. This is basically the integral of u squared du, where uh, you go from the limits. Uh, so it's basically u at uh, minus pi over two, which is sine of two times minus pi over two, which is minus sine over pi. And then uh, the other limit of integration is sine of pi. So this one is easy to integrate. It's basically u cubed over three with these limits of integrations, but sine of pi is zero, so this will vanish. And so the true contribution is related to this term, which is giving you pi over 16. So it seemed quite a complicated integral. Actually, the change variables to treat uh, functions made it uh, simpler and manageable, and you just have to be savvy in order how to handle the terms, uh, basically using uh, algebra to, to get the shortest path <laughs> to the answer. So, well, once you have done that, uh, essentially, okay, you are in this part, you have the factor of one over d uh, to the fifth power. Um, so you just have to plug in this result, right? So this is uh, one over d to the fifth power times pi over 16. Um, so you're done. Then once you have calculated all the integrals, you use your results. Mm, the energy is to d cubed over pi and then uh, well, you have this integral on one hand, well, for which we calculated this result. And for this other, um, we also calculated the result. Uh, so we just plug in the answers. Um, so basically the result of our calculation was pi over 16 d to the fifth, which is over here, and times this factor. And for the other, we had pi over 2b, if you remember. Um, so, well, basically what you have to do is some polishing and some cancellation. Uh, you have a factor of four, then you have 16. So that's why you have the one over four here. Then you have b cubed and b to the fifth, which is why you have b squared. Um, yeah, then you still have uh, h bar over n. So that's fine. And the factor of pi, of pi cancels. For the other, uh, yeah, I mean, in a way the cancellation is cleaner, basically to be over pi is used and you still have b squared uh, on this part. So again, you have this feature where one term is proportional say to b squared, the other is inverse uh, to b squared. And the point is that each one of these two terms goes to infinity either when you go to zero or when you go to infinity. So again, because b is positive, uh, the minimum is a critical point inside the, the domain. So we just have to find the critical point uh, by making the derivative go to zero in this case. And um, 
that's what we do. So for the first term, basically you have 2b times all this, which uh, gives you an omega squared b. For the other, you have b to the minus 2, which derivative uh, considered is minus 2b to the minus 3. Then you pass to the other side to um, count for the minus. Then, um, well, there's a cancellation of 2 over 4, which it, uh, gives you 1 half. Then basically you have to pass the b to the other side, which gives you a power of 4 uh, with this b. But you pass m squared, uh, an omega squared, which uh, with this m gives you an m omega squared in the denominator. Things are quite simplified at this point. You only have to basically consider b squared and uh, b. So if you take square root, uh, things are nicer. Have h bar over m omega times the square root of 2. And then if you take further square root uh, to get b naught, then basically 2 be, will be to the 1 how, uh, one fourth power. Then you have square root of h bar over, over m omega. So at this point, we have obtained the optimization argument um, that minimizes the energy. We just have to calculate it, right? And so we know that the energy as a function of the optimization parameter looks like this. So we plug in the value. Uh, so uh, plugging in, for example, for the b squared, you have, uh, which is why I calculated this because it's appearing in both numerator and denominator. So you have m omega squared over two times h bar over m omega square root of two. And for the other, you have to flip it. So you have h bar over 4m uh, times the inverse, which is m omega square root of 2 divided by h bar. So there is some cancellation, particularly for the m's, maybe some factors um, for 4 and square root of 2. Uh, over here, you have cancellation of m omega. So first, this term, basically only one, one omega will survive, and you have in the denominator 2 square root of 2. For the other, uh, if you basically think of 4 as 2 times 2, uh, basically, that's why you get 2 square root of 2 over here. And h bar will go, and then you have h bar omega as dm's disappeared. And yeah, I mean, the terms are quite symmetric, which again is a feature of minimization problems in one dimension. Um, so, uh, well, you have basically twice this term, um, which, well, since you have a factor of 2 in the denominator, is can be expressed in many ways, right? First thing, so you mean h bar omega divided by square root of two. Basically, if you keep this factor because you recognize it as the ground energy of the harmonic oscillator, which is what we're dealing with, then you'll have two over square root of two separating terms appropriately. And uh, well, this will give you square root of two, right? And so this is actually a more reasonable uh, answer in the sense that, um, well, you know that you, want to be close to the ground state. You don't know how far away you are. But for this case, you know that the energy of the ground state is h bar omega over 2. The only thing is that for your family of functions considered, uh, there is a factor of a square root of 2, which uh, indicates how far away you are from the ground state. So basically, in terms of um, ground uh, state of the harmonic oscillator units, if you take the difference between the upper bound and the true ground state. Uh, when you do this estimation, basically you have h bar omega over two and then a factor of a square root of two minus one. And because the square root of two is around 1.41, basically the difference is uh, 0 0.41 of uh, a ground state. So this is how far away you are. Um, so how close is this upper bound uh, from the from the two ground state, which basically you're fitting a Lorentzian into a Gaussian. Uh, well, I mean, it depends. It's basically far away by 0.4, um, which is quite uh, close to 0.5. So honestly, it's a little bit higher than I would have expected from intuition, um, because qualitatively, uh, it looks like a bell-shaped curve. However, there are some properties of Lorentzians which are very crazy and which might account for this difference particularly that they don't decay to infinity fast enough. And so maybe that uh, the fact that the tail is quite large at infinity is uh, accounting for this difference, which is bigger than I would have expected, but I mean, it's fine. Such is life, you knew that you would have a, an upper bound anyways, and at least you got to the fact that they are, basically this is proportional to the ground state and the proportionality factor is the square root of two for the upper bound, so well. 
Okay, so I have hammered as many problems as I can to give you some practice uh, for how to handle these variational principle problems. So hopefully that will help uh, in this lecture and uh, the previous one. So I'm gonna give some concluding remarks and they are the following. Uh, it's basically related to, we presented the theory first of the variational principle, which it's a theorem then we presented uh, an approximation method for the energy of the ground state based on the variational principle, which is called the variational method, also called the Rayleigh-Ritz. And we presented many examples to get you a uh, flavor of the actual use of the variational method. And to basically also clarify some concepts along the way. So I want to rephrase part of the theory that I presented at the beginning and also present some new theory so that we kind of like we understand uh, or understand better the topic in a second visit to the concept. So basically at the beginning in the first lecture we proved the variational principle. And so that's a theory that basically indicates that uh, the minimization of the energy functional by the extension and state under analysis, which is the, for example, the ground state or the first excited state in the corollary. Um, so we can reinterpret it in the following way. So basically you can think of the energy as a functional, which is basically a mapping uh, where the arguments are functions and which uh, go to the real numbers. And so this energy functional in which the arguments are the functions, it's again the expectation value of the Hamiltonian over normalized wave functions. You have to define the Hamiltonian of course, uh, which is defined up to potential. So let's think of a given potential. Uh, general and appropriate for assumptions, etc. But, um, well, one little comment that I want to make is that under appropriate boundary conditions, meaning that it will banish the boundary terms uh, related to the integration by parts of this term when I plug it in and here. Um, actually, we can represent the energy functional in this way. So this is, of course, the original representation. If the boundary terms when integrating by parts, this part uh, goes to zero. Basically what I have is a more symmetric form, which is the inner product of the derivative of the wave function with itself. Now, what I'm assuming is that the boundary term Spanish. So this is an assumption, of course, which in many quantum problems or applications will happen. Um, but I just want to mention it, which is basically if I integrate by parts integral related to this, what I will have is basically the valuation of this term at the boundary plus the, this other integral where I pass basically one derivative to the other side and I have a plus. So I'm assuming that these boundary terms will vanish. Um, and the assumption is not so crazy if you think that for example, for problems where you have minus infinity infinity, you usually impose the K conditions such that the function or even its derivative uh, go to infinity, but well, as long as the product of five prime times five, meaning the derivative times the function goes to zero, when you go to infinity, you're fine. And also for problems where you have a finite domain where the boundary conditions for either the function or this derivative are such that this uh, uh, boundary term, basically the difference of the valuation of this term between A and minus A will vanish, this will be satisfied. So this is quite common in quantum problems, but you have to be careful to make sure uh, that you're in this case to basically go from this form to this form. But never mind, this uh, form looks more symmetric because now you have basically the uh, norm of uh, this term, which is proportional to the derivative. You just have a factor of h1 divided by the square root of 2n. And then this is the expectation value of the potential. So this is just a little comment since we did the integration by parts uh, many times in our problems. And maybe, well, first of all, I want to present it as a resource when the boundary conditions uh, vanish. Um, so you can use it and it looks like this and it's quite symmetric and nice. Uh, so the second comment most importantly that I want to make in this revisiting of the theory of the, of the um, variational method and variational principle is the following. So under the assumption of well-behaved potentials, etc. So the eigenvalue problem that we are trying to estimate, not solve, because that's the whole point of the variational method, 
you're trying to estimate at least an upper bound, which hopefully will be close from physical intuition for the ground state without solving the actual eigenvalue problem. That's first of all the um, important point. The second is that, uh, well, this eigenvalue problem for Schrodinger is a storm level problem. And so there are many problems in, uh, or sorry, many properties of the storm level theory that you probably know from ordinary or partial differential equations, which is that there is a ground state. Maybe you'll have a case of degeneracy, but in any case, there is basically a lowest eigenvalue. And uh, also there is at least a function which is representing a ground state, which we're gonna call psi, which of course we can normalize. And that it minimizes the energy functional uh, or any normalized wave function, meaning that this function normalized, of course. So it's defined up to a phase, but I mean, normalization does that, right? So basically, it will be the function in the whole Hilbert space, restricting myself also to normalize functions in the Hilbert space, such that, um, well, actually, yeah, I want to make a comment. Uh, uh, one second. Yeah, so basically over, if you consider all uh, functions in the Hilbert space of norm one, the one that achieves the minimum energy is precisely the ground state. So this is important, right? Because basically thinking of this as a functional where the arguments are functions themselves, the ground state or one of the ground states if you are in a generous situation is the function argument that minimizes the energy over all normalized functions in the Hilbert space. So, I mean, this sounds like a reiteration of the theory, but just more formal. However, it's not uh, because uh, we can use this understanding to define numerical methods that actually will let us estimate an upper bound. So at this point, this is still the variational principle. So this result holds in general. It's due to storm Liouville and plus properties of averages, which is how I did the proof in last lecture. So now that we have presented the theorem based on the storm Liouville and averages, which is the variational principle, the variational method, it's a technique, which is based on the variational principle, but it's a method that lets you find an upper bound for the ground energy. So the ground, the fact that it's a ground energy, it's guaranteed by the variational principle above. So this is clear, but uh, although in principle, you'll always get an upper bound. So you have a greater equal. What we want to do or we intend to do is to make the bound as close as possible to the ground energy based on physical intuition, which is uh, namely what you'll consider is basically a subset of the Hilbert space. And you will propose a family of functions that represent that subset where the form of these functions uh, by physical intuition seems what you would have expected from the true ground state, at least qualitatively. So what you're gonna do is to choose a subset of the Hilbert space, which is, uh, we're gonna call H alpha. And the elements are normalized function in a family uh, which is parameterized by an index alpha. So basically different elements in the family have a parameter alpha and we're going to choose the space h uh, alpha such that the trial functions resemble what we expect uh, from physical intuition from the ground state so that hopefully we're not too far away uh, from the from the true ground state and now uh, the fact is that the variational principle uh, this upper bound still holds for the subset so the energy of any function in the family of functions which are normalized by assumption, this is still gonna be greater or equal than the energy of the ground state. So, because this is a subset of the Hilbert space and this subset is considering normalized functions. But the point is that instead of considering basically a minimization over all functions in the Hilbert space, because functions in the family H alpha are defined by a parameter, 
Now, basically, the variational method, when you restrict to this subspace of normalized functions identified by a parameter alpha, uh, the variational method consists on finding the parameter that minimizes the energy. So instead of basically working over functions, right? So what you have is that the minimizer in this family can be recognized as basically the function defined by a parameter such that the energy is minimal. So instead of like working with the function itself, you work with the parameter space. So uh, basically the minimizer is the function whose parameter minimizes the energy, the energy being a function of the wave function recognized by the parameter alpha. And so the minimum energy over the family of functions consider H alpha, it's basically the energy evaluated at this minimizer. So it's the minimum value of the energy as a function of alpha, since the function is a function of alpha itself, since it's identified by a parameter. So it's a minimum over uh, the parameter space considered. So what we did is go essentially from an abstract minimization problem in the Hilbert space, because, sorry, uh, functions were in the Hilbert space, normalized of course, to a subspace or a subset. No claim that it's a vector subspace yet. But once you do that, the problem becomes simpler because the parameters belong to a given space. And so particularly if you consider parameters of finite dimension, this becomes basically a calculus problem or a complex variable problem. But um, what we did is simplify uh, the problem to go from an abstract formulation to basically a more concrete uh, minimization problem where you're going to minimize over the space in which the parameters live. Uh, so um, the point is that we can choose the trial space functions as simple or as complicated as we want. And the parameter, again, I have to stress that it lives on a parameter space. It can be a real scalar, in which case the parameter lives in the space of the real numbers, for example, or the complex numbers, uh, if it was a complex scalar. It can be a vector, um, which, well, uh, basically, in that case, alpha would belong to Rn. In the case of the complex numbers, since they have two components, it is isomorphous to um, R2. And, uh, well, the point is that for scalars, vectors, even matrices, because matrices can be reformulated as vectors uh, if you go into column or row ordering appropriately. You, these problems are typical minimization problems that you have seen in your previous courses in calculus. Uh, even for example, the case of complex uh, parameters in complex analysis or matrices, etc. Maybe you have even taken a course of tensor calculus if you um, have studied relativity. So, I mean, my point is that as long as the dimension of the parameter or the number of parameters, because alpha will be basically a vector, for example. So as long as the number of parameters is finite, these are equivalent to typical minimization problems that you know how to handle from your courses. And uh, the point is that once you increase the dimension of the parameter space, um, well, the fact that uh, the minimizer might be at the boundary is more important and more complicated to handle. And so you need to be more careful. It's different from the fact that you have 1D parameters and you have points of the boundary. But never mind. We're going to study a particular case, uh, which is slightly or needs a slightly different uh, management of the, of, uh, of the normalization. But let's think of the particular case when you have trial space of functions that is indeed a vector subspace. So for that, I need the functions to not be normalized. So I'm going to allow the functions to uh, not be normalized. And I'm simply going to normalize the energy or work with normalized functions at the very end when I compute the energy. So if you remember actually from the problem from the first homework, there was an issue. Basically, normalized functions um, cannot be a vector space because uh, or functions of norm one, because zero wouldn't belong to the space on one hand, or if you add a function by itself, then it becomes of norm two and it's not normalized. So 
I'm going to relax uh, the uh, assumption of the space being of normalized functions so that I can have a vector space. And so basically what I have functions of this form, which are linear combinations of a given basis functions. And the parameters are going to be the coefficients uh, that are multiplying the basis for the definition of this function. So what you have is that the parameter alpha is going to be a vector in a space of dimension n. So it's basically uh, in Rn. You have a pre-selected basis of functions of dimension n as well. And this is going to be the basis for my vector subspace. So now I'm indeed claiming that h alpha is a vector subspace. So um, it's basically a subspace of the Hilbert space originally. It is a finite dimension n. And the parameters are basically the coefficients of the linear combinations. So it's clear how the parameter is acting in order to identify uh, each element in the family. The, you have a vector of parameters, or the alpha is a vector, whose coefficients are, or whose components are the coefficients of the linear combinations. Now, this is very convenient. Again, bear in mind that I will normalize at the very end. So don't be worried. Things will be handled appropriately. <clears throat> the point is that if I define my h alpha in this way, because alpha is a vector in Rn, this is equivalent to a calculus minimization problem, even if, even if it's in multidimensional calculus or multivariable calculus. So what you're going to do is to first allow the functions to not be normalized, to let h alpha to be a vector space of dimension n. But then when you compute the energy functional, what you're going to do is to compute the average of the Hamiltonian divided by the norm. So because that way, well, basically, this is equal to norm squared. So you could put this inside and uh, phi alpha divided by norm of uh, phi alpha is normalized. So this is a, an appropriate handling for the fact that we are dealing with non-normalized functions because we normalize at the very end in the calculation of the energy. Uh, this is doable. Maybe you have actually done this in your previous course at some point. So this is an acceptable quantum mechanics result. And then what you're going to do is to look for the minimizer over Rn except for the zero, such that it minimizes the energy function defined this way. So what you're doing is to look for the argument over non-zero vectors in Rn, such that the energy defined in this way is minimized, right? And so what you're minimizing is this function of the average Hamiltonian divided by the norm squared of uh, the functions considered. And um, because this is the minimizer, the minimum value of the energy over the space considered, it's basically the minimum value over all non-zero alphas in Rn of the energy defined this way. So why do we discard alpha equal to zero or the vector zero? is because it's a physical and acceptable solution and it's trivial. So most importantly, it's physical and acceptable because in that case, phi of zero would be zero. And then basically it has zero norm and it doesn't have any probability. So it's basically, you have absence of particles or elements. So there's no point. So, and it's a trivial solution anyway, so I mean, uh, so never mind. So um, this is a particular case. Uh, this is a particular case for the space we have considered. So, where the family of functions is a vector space, where we have adapted the normalization conditions to allow for vector spaces or subspaces, and we can equivalently represent this uh, in the following way, uh, in terms of the set of normalized functions. Because once we recognize that we are normalizing at the very end, basically what you are obtaining is um, that alpha naught is the argument uh, minimizing over all, uh, uh, well, over all functions which are of norm one of its energy. So think of it that basically you put norm squared and you put one norm here and one norm here on inside. So you're minimizing over all functions of norm one in this H alpha space defined by this vector alpha. So, and the energy, um, the minimum value of the energy is precisely the minimum value of the energy over all uh, functions of norm one in the subspace, vector subspace H alpha, which doesn't need normalization because I have already normalized by this condition. And 
the fact is that the definition of the problem in this way, where I first allow my H alpha to be a vector subspace uh, with functions not normalized, but then I normalize when I compute the energy, has a name, and that's called the Ritz method. So for this particular case where I allow H alpha to be a vector subspace of the Hilbert space, there is quite a very, very known technique for this is the Ritz method. And actually it can let you define a numerical technique. So basically by doing scientific computation, you can calculate approximate um, values of the energy or these upper bounds. So this is a particular case of the rayleigh Ritz method uh, where you allow vector subspaces and you do some modifications to get uh, appropriate quantum mechanical results. And so the variational method in general, as I mentioned to you in last class, is called rayleigh Ritz method. Uh, this version of the variational method restricted to vector subspaces where you do some changes is only the Ritz method. And what you're doing is basically minimizing over the subset H alpha of the Hilbert space. And you're still providing only an upper bound for the ground state because essentially what you have is that the minimizer over H alpha, which is the minimizer over functions of norm one over this vector subspace, um, because it's a subspace, it's a well, of the Hilbert space is still greater or equal than the true ground state energy, which is actually the full minimizer or sorry, the full minimum value over all functions of norm one over the whole Hilbert space. So the fact that H alpha is a subset is showing that this is happening. So this is your best estimate, but this is still an upper bound. The point is that you have to choose H alpha appropriately. Now that you have defined this, basically is by choosing appropriately the basis functions so that you get a uh, reasonable um, estimation of the, of the ground state, of the true ground state. So again, I'm just trying to present this because this is theory that actually by appropriately taking care of all the quantum mechanical aspects, lets you compute numerically approximations of the ground state for the case of a parameter dimension greater than one. In this case where you have a vector parameter um, with dimension n with n greater than one. And again, the application of this Ritz method, which is a particular case of the rayleigh Ritz method, it's that you can do a computational implementation by basically looking for the parameters uh, vector parameters that minimize the energy. Uh, so, I mean, this would be a calculus in multivariables uh, problem. This can be implemented computationally uh, to find numerically the energy minimizer in the appropriate space. And um, well, again, the question, right? Because a uh, variational principle only proves that it's an upper bound. Your argument on how close or how far you will be from the minimum energy or the energy of the ground state it's again based on physical intuition. So the physical intuition, the heuristics of this method numerically is that if you choose appropriate trial space functions, uh, basically um, such that the linear combination might resemble the ground state like this. And actually I want to add um, something, some comment. By the basis, because at the end of the day, it depends up to the basis that you choose. Um, choosing a problem. Uh, maybe I'll modify this. Well, so by choosing appropriate trial space functions uh, such that the linear combination. such that the basis will give a clear combination that in principle might resemble, yeah, exactly. So what you do is you choose appropriately the basis such that when you do linear combinations of it, the resulting functions from the linear combinations might resemble the behavior that you would expect from the ground state for the potential under uh, consideration. And so, if you choose appropriate basis functions, the linear combinations will hopefully resemble up to a part of the ground state. And basically this um, physical intuition will pay off by basically giving a minimum energy that will be hopefully somehow close. But that's, um, that is more about physical intuition and it's more heuristics in a hand wavy way. So 
well, um, if you think about it, just to summarize the whole uh, chapter, the Lorentzian qualitatively behaves like a Gaussian. What's the difference with the behavior of the Gaussian? The tail doesn't go to zero fast enough. And so that in my physical intuition, it's what is probably accounting for the fact that it's basically in uh, ground state units uh, around 0.4 or not too far from 0.5 of the true ground energy bound, which is in my personal point of view, a big difference, but it really depends on the finesse of how you choose the functions to resemble physical property. Uh, it can be many ways. I mean, usually um, you would choose the basis actually not uh, linearly independent, but they might have some overlap. Uh, uh, so it might not be, sorry, sorry, I said something really stupid. Um, the basis might not be orthonormal. That's what I meant to say. So although they might be linearly independent by definition of a basis, um, actually what happens is that uh, you don't want them to be orthonormal. Uh, what you could do is to, for example, for a very weird unknown potential, choose uh, five possible candidates of ground state that resemble the ground states that you know for uh, other potentials, right? I mean, or maybe a combination of say Gaussian plus truncated parabola plus Laurentian, just because your potential is might, um, might be so weird that, um, that uh, it will be, uh, you're proposing the three candidates and maybe a linear combination all the better. I mean, for, there's always a chance that one of the coefficients or two of the coefficients will be zero. So you don't lose too much by basically uh, providing uh, different candidates. Uh, there are some examples like uh, one in a Griffith problem that actually what you do is to propose the basis in the usual way, orthonormal, uh, linearly uh, representing different oscillations, etc. So it really depends on the application and their consideration. And of course, on the potential that given the shape of the potential, you'll have some intuition into what you can choose as a basis function appropriately. But in any case, my goal was to present the theory related to how the particular case of um, H alpha being a vector subspace can basically provide us with a numerical technique, which is the Ritz method, which is a particular version of the variational method in order to calculate numerically by means of coding um, the uh, an upper bound for the ground state, which we hope will resemble the energy of the um, mm, of, of the ground state. So hope uh, this was clarifying and that this is helpful. Try to do as many problems as possible to give you, give you a flavor on how they have to be solved and also some theory to combine uh, refined conceptual understanding with uh, numerical techniques. So see you soon and I hope um, you will like the lecture.